as a trainer, as a counselor, as a coach, there is a, a term that I usually listen to, and I mean, I give it like, uh, I mean, I, I never think about it, I use it. it is, the term is education. And so I, I mean, so I work with educators, I educate people, I train people, and uh, I work with uh, teachers and other kind of people who work with children. And all of them say, we work in the education. So my, my question is, what's education? What's the essence of being an educator? So not being a teacher, not be a trainer, not be something else, but being edu an educator. And I found this, uh, this story, it's a true story from, by Mario Calabresi. Uh, it's a book. The title of the book is Pushing Past the Night, Coming to Terms with Italy Terrorist. And it's a, a story from the 70s about uh, an inspector, a police inspector, who was killed by terrorists. But this is not the, the reason I choose it as an example of real education, but it's, there is a part where Mario, with, with, who was uh, two years and a half old when his father was killed, uh, recollect that event. And I think there, there is the essence of what means to be an educator. So I'm going to read to you uh, a part of this story, and then I will comment about that. The title of the chapter is The Blue Flat 500, 500, uh, the car. In the spring of 1972, I had just turned two. Our memories don't normally go back that far, they get erased. Some impression may remain, like a spin on the merry-go-round, fish in an aquarium, a ride on a motorbike, or a scolding from your parents, or a joke by an uncle. I have two memories from that period. The first is from Sunday, May 14. It's a vague memory of a wonderful feeling and the only real palpable recollection that I have of my father. The second is from the morning of Wednesday, May 17, the day of his murder. It's sharp, detailed, precise. It's as if I have put all my childhood thoughts in a box, a special place I had created where they could survive intact the oblivion of time and maturity. For years, I kept them inside to me, to avoid ruining them. But at one point, however, I realized that my telling and retelling of this memory was destroying it, like the copy of a film that's been seen too many times. The image deteriorates and wall frames are lost, so I ran for shelter and filed them away in an attempt to save them but maybe it was already too late. And today they have lost some of the overwhelming force they wielded over me for more than 20 years of my life. But the first memory has resisted and it reminds me that I am his son. They shot my father at 9.15 a.m. while he was opening the door of my mother's blue Fiat 500. He had just left the house after going back twice first to smooth an unruly lock of hair, then to change his tie. My mother closed the door and she was waiting for a woman who was scheduled to arrive at any moment. They had never met, but the woman was supposed to start coming twice a week to help her out at home. There was too much work with two children and the third on the way. The woman arrived late, out of breath. My apologies, signora, but there is pandemonium down on the street. Someone shot a police inspector. In contrast, in contrast to her negative thoughts and premonition of earlier weeks, my mother now seemed more inclined to deny that anything might have happened. To survive the next few moments, she grasped at flimsy explanation and improbable coincidences, hoping to somehow alter the course of destiny until the doorbell rang. When she went to open it, she found our neighbor 
Mr. Franco Federico, a tailor and a friend of my grandfather. In the spirit of true friendship, he had bravely shouldered one of the worst tasks that life can assign to you. Signor Federico, to what do I owe this pleasure? My mother asked, forcing herself to a smile. But he couldn't speak, and he stood there in silence. In an instant, the castle of hope that was still standing, despite everything, came crashing down. She retreated into the house, howling, no, trying to flee the truth. My memory begins with her cry of despair. He tried to speak with her, but she kept running away, walking from room to room while I clung to her skirt. Frozen in my memory is the image of the two of us in black and white, circling for a long, long time. I was worried that he wanted to hurt her, but I didn't know how to defend her. Finally, she stood still. He spoke with her. She wept. And I hugged her legs, feeling lost. For years, I was afraid of Signor Federico. Whenever he came near me, I would start to cry uncontrollably. Every Christmas, he would bring me a nice present, but I would keep my distance. And in the first few years, I even refused to open his gifts. Over time, we were able to reach a compromise. He would place the package in the middle of my grandparents' living room and then walk away. Slowly, furtively, like a cat getting ready to pounce, I would snack up to it, grab it, and steal away with it, quickly to another room. I would circle it for a while and then open it very. No one came with me. They would leave me alone, give me all the time I needed. When Signor Federico was about to go, my grandfather would call out to me. Only then would I peek out from behind the door to say thank you. The last time I saw him, he still had the white moustache and white hair, very thick and shiny. More than 10 years had gone by since our last encounter. He was in a bed at the San Carlo Hospital, the same place they had taken my father and he was dying. Although he hadn't seen me since I was a little boy, he recognized me and brightened up as soon as I came into the room. We spoke for a fairly long time and then I stroked his hair. It was still smooth and he told me, you have given me the nicest gift I could ever wish for. People often make lists of wasted opportunities. I also keep a list of the opportunities that were not wasted. And that afternoon figures at the very top of it. So this is a sad story. And it's a story seen with the eyes of a baby who was two years and a half old. And it's interesting because it tells us what happens to a baby, how a baby sees life. And I think it's an, a great example of education because Signor Federico, Signor Franco Federico, took the worst mission, I think, the worst uh, charge that one can have in a life, telling to someone else that his father is dead and he, her husband is dead. Although Signor Federico took the charge and didn't refuse it, put himself in this very uncomfortable position and kept that position for years with that baby. So the relationship began with this kind of trauma and 
Mario every Christmas refuses to talk with Signor Franco and at the same time every year, every time Signor Franco continue to stay in that place. So not too near to Mario and not too far. Accepted the fact that his relationship with Mario was made like that and took responsibility for that. And I think that this is one of the characteristics of education, taking responsibility of staying in a relationship no matter how bad can be the circumstances. And without trying to change them, just accepting the fact that you appear in the life of a baby as a teacher, as an educator, and you, and you have some given conditions and you do not decide the condition. Signor Franco Federico could have choose that situation, I don't think. Uh, it was just there and he took responsibility for being there in that moment. And the second thing that I, the second thought that I have, uh, and I think this, this represents a good example of education, is that many years later, 20 years later, uh, when that child is an adult, that child remembers that relationship. And it's grateful for that relationship and remembers it. And this is the effect of education. You do something today in a relationship, you accept the relationship uh, the way it is, and many years later, you see the effect, and you are remembered. And not just, it's not just for sake of being remembered, but it is like if you are remembered, it means that you were meaningful in the educational relationship. So this is why I am thankful that Mario recalled this very dreadful episode of his life because it gives us a glimpse of uh, what education is. And to me, Signor Franco Federico is uh, a very great example of educator, or what means to be an educator.